I don't know if you can hear in the background. No, but there's it's perfect. The, woman, the woman next door, there's a little restaurant next door to us and the woman is playing an acoustic Leroy um, uh, Cohen song right now, Hallelujah. She's singing this beautiful acoustic version in a very sort of Spanish sound that's just beautiful timing to be playing in the background while we're all gathering together. So I think that's quite beautiful. Or Le uh, not Leo, not Leroy, what am I trying to say? Cohen. Leon, not Leon. Who is it? Cohen, what's, he passed Leon away. Cohen. Yeah, it's amazing rendition she's doing for all of us right now. Okay, guys. Um, Nasha, I can hear you. Can you say something? I can hear you perfectly. Okay, fantastic. Life. Okay, guys, good evening. I am so excited. I just about pinching myself because today is a very, very, very special evening. Uh, my name is Dr. Silverman. Uh, I live in uh, snowy um, Alberta, Canada. And uh, by life, I practice surgical pathology, aka I diagnose cancers. However, by, uh, by mission and by my passion, I teach health. So being a cell, cell, cell doctor and a pathologist, I learn cells and my mission is actually how to teach people to make cells healthy and happy. Because after all, we are what I call is a lump of cells. And for us to stay happy and healthy, we need to make our lump of cells back to health and happiness. Today is a very, very special Zoom because I have a very special guest who is a very dear friend of mine, Dr. Nasha Winters. Uh, I've met Nasha a couple years ago by now, and we absolutely connected on that energy of helping people and discovering health. Uh, Nasha is obviously my mentor in this regard, and she is, oh, listen to this. I need to use a cheat sheet. Dr. Winters, a naturopathic doctor, and then there's a whole bunch of things that I don't understand. LA, diplomat of IOM, FABNO, founder, CEO, visionary of Optimal Terrain uh, Consulting. So, um, She's a fellow of American Board of Naturopathic Oncology. She's an amazing person, and she trains doctors in multiple ways. She trains doctors in mistletoe, mistletoe therapy. She's a foremost expert in the metabolic and cancer relationships. She's an author of bestseller, Metabolic Approach to Cancer. Who knows mitochondria better than Nasha Winters? But Nasha Winter's story probably started when she was in her late teens. Uh, Nasha Winters is a cancer warrior. And you know, welcome Nasha. You are always a joy to work with. Thank we you. have some hilarious photos, you and I, of times at the Environmental Health Symposium where our paths cross often. You know, I think today we really downplay the importance of our environmental environment around us. And it's beautiful to see a breast cancer expert pathologist convening with these crazy naturopathic docs around what drives a cancerous process, what makes our lump of cells thrive or dive. And that's where we bound over some hilarious conversations around our, our meetings together then. And we've done this live Facebook with others and it's been really well received among your tribe and my tribe, and they're kind of finding and cross-pollinating with one another. So I'm really honored to be part of all of you today. So thank you for having me back, Doc. It's just, it's fun to see you. And I'm, I'm sorry, it's a little bit uh, scattered in my first night back with you this evening, because it's been a little bit of a crazy day, but here we are. Here it's we are. awesome. It's absolutely awesome. You know what, actually, I wanted to start with, it came on, this year, I did a very small study. I did a study on tumorous uh, breast cancer, tumorous mitochondria mm -hmm. uh, upon electron microscopy. And electron microscopy is the highest magnification where we actually can see the organelles. Wow, cool. So the staggering fact of how abnormal, how mm -hmm. ugly a typical tumorous mitochondria is, was just absolutely astonishing to me, but the proof of the pudding that we need to turn that ugliest, 
or we cannot even let the normal ones to turn into the ugliest. However, what was staggering to me that that mitochondria was studded by glycogen, mm. meaning that mitochondria was studded by sugar that was feeding that mitochondria. So that was incredible. So let's start. Dr. Winters, can I actually probe you a little bit? Can you please tell us something about when you were 19 years old yeah. and why you are where you are right now, looking incredible? Oh my God. I just realized I probably have lettuce in my teeth. I had some salad earlier. So. Guys, she had salad. <laughs> She had salad. She did not have I donuts. Did have some shrimp on she my salad. salad. It came out she of the water today. <laughs> she had salad. I love it. I love it. Well, I mean, you have to remember that at 19, 20, I was just literally leaving my 19th year on this planet, morphing into my 20th year. I'm a sophomore in college. I'd spent the last eight to 10 months in and out of the ER almost monthly without fail, begging for someone to help me figure out what the heck was going on. I'd had a long life of not feeling well. And unfortunately, everyone just kept blaming it on my past history of IBS, Hashimoto's, polycystic ovarian syndrome. Actually, back then they didn't know Hashimoto's, they just knew thyroid dysfunction back in 91. But they knew I had endometriosis. I mean, you're luckily I'm looking around this room here of beautiful faces and names that I recognize, some I don't. But the reality is, is it was as a woman back in 1991, I was a hot mess hormonally. Um, all of these issues were compounded by the fact that no one took me seriously ending up in the ER every month where they just simply were like histrionic teenage female, you know, maybe she's got IBS flares, maybe her endometriosis is really flaring, maybe she has PID, maybe she has an ectopic pregnancy. So everyone just kept making their own assumptions and assertions over me. And it was like the desperation of me begging and pleading for someone to listen, which I'm sure looking around this room, if you will, that a lot of you have been there where you're like, something's not right. Something's not right. And no one really honoring what was going on for you. That's where in, uh, before my, just before my 20th birthday and it landed up in the emergency room, basically unresponsive. My oxygen, my oxygen levels were in the seventies at room level. I had fluid building up around my heart, very dangerous in the medical world. As Dr. Silverman knows, I had a huge abdominal fluid built up known as ascites. I was extremely sarcopenic, cachexic, and metabolic wasting. I was extremely malnourished, um, unbelievably sick, and my liver and my kidneys were in complete and utter failure. Not a, not a great place to be. And thanks to a visiting physician who at that point, they had to treat me like a medical emergency, realized what was going on. And I was then unfortunately diagnosed with terminal stage four in stage organ failure cancer. And I was too sick to even take on a single dose of conventional therapy. So they sort of sent me out to pasture, which happens, right? And that's the place where understanding now in retrospect as a doctor looking at this, I don't blame them because I was the zebra. That was not what you'd expect to see in 1991 of a 19-year-old woman. Okay, so in fairness to the physicians in the emergency room, to the physicians who saw me, no one was looking for this. That was a very rare thing to see back then. Flash forward nearly 29 years, it'll be 29 years this coming October. Um, in the past year, year and a half, I have seen 10 kids little girls under the age of 10 with stage four ovarian cancer. That, my friends, is not normal. And that's where the, the spate is in, in my life. We are out there wondering and asking the questions of why. And so that sort of preempts our conversation tonight is, as I love that Dr. Sveda said so elegantly, we're just a big glump of cells. So what makes them line up and behave accordingly or what makes them clump up and uh, behave in a really rogue sort of way? And that became my mission at age, you know, then by the time the official diagnosis came, I was just entered into my 20th year and they told me I had a matter of months with treatment, but there was no treatment they could offer me. So with that, I thought if I'm going out, I'm going to learn everything I can. And my mom will tell you and the people that know me will tell you I was pretty stubborn. I was also pre-med. I was in a science, you know, very science rich environment. And I started digging 
And thanks to that, I'm still digging today, 29, almost 29 years later, and still learning things about myself and about the thousands and thousands of patients I've had the privilege to work with. And it has come down for me in my own approach about this concept of our clump of cells and how they decide to hang out with one another um, where the magic happens. The tumor itself, the cancer cells themselves are not the issue. It's how our an environment wrapped around those cells is where the magic happens. This is where we, all of us collectively listening right now can make the biggest difference is what is happening wrapped around those cells in any given moment. Thank you. You, you, you know that you're literally a star. That's weird. You but, are, but, you but are, thank you. <laughs> you're literally a star who resonated that you are, you're shining with that life of the personal experience and that personal learning. It doesn't get any more real and yeah. any more brighter than that. Thank you. Listen, thank you. Yeah. Well, and it's funny, Doc, you know, the, I'm seeing a few names in this room that I would also say are these huge shining stars that have learned um, in this process and working with me and working with others who think like me, that we are far more powerful than we're led to believe. And that our ability to under, really know thyself, really understand what makes us tick, really Absolutely. be able to test, assess, and address our terrain in the most profound way can have the biggest outcome. It, it doesn't even matter what treatment we choose, what diet, what lifestyle, what supplement, what pharmaceutical intervention, it's around our deeper understanding of why we got there and how we can turn this ship around in the harbor. And that's where I feel like you and I really connected, Sveta, was in our understanding of the world in, on, and around us and how it impacts our well-being. Absolutely. Everything around, everything evolves and around, around one word, why. Mm. Yes. And then, and the second one, how yeah Whew. yeah yeah now now let's talk about a mitochondria mm -hmm. let me ask the creatures <laughs> the dearest mitochondria yeah dr nasha winters why mitochondria is the core element of a cellular well-being well it's funny because if any of you ever took you know biology in say sixth grade, the only thing any of us were ever taught, if you've been taught biology in the last say 50 years, um, it's even still to this day because I ask my nieces and nephews and my godchildren what they're learning about the mitochondria and it's still this sort of concept of there's this little tiny organelle, like a mini organ within a cell that is the powerhouse. It's the, it's the cell where we make ATP, which is basically the currency of our life. Okay, so when we think down to this level, we were like, oh, that's interesting, great, the mighty mitochondria. But what we have since learned, I have a colleague, Dr. Lee No, K-N-O-W, wrote a brilliant, super simple, straightforward book on mitochondrial health. He's actually a naturopathic doctor. Um, there's a couple other books um, in that same genre about the general things we've been learning in the last few years about a mitochondria. And what we didn't know about the mitochondria, at least in the past 50 years in our basic biology classes, is that it has many other roles than just being an energy factory. That's but one tiny little job description that it has, right? I love that you're nodding emphatically because really, can you, I mean, as a pathologist, what were you taught about mitochondria in? Uh, same thing. Yeah. Uh, same thing. Uh, powerhouse, energy, yeah. ATP. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> and, and you were like, yeah, that's pretty cool. But even then it was sort of like downplayed. We never even understood what that even meant, right? Even when we were told. Even for that one role as a mitochondria, as a powerhouse, that's good enough because without that powerhouse, the cell cannot exist, whether we like it or not. Exactly. That's a really very, very accurate statement and that no ATP, no life. You know, it's like it kind of gets down to this basic thing. You're building blocks of, of uh, energetic currency when it stops. When the money runs out, you're done. I mean, that was sort of what we were taught. But even then, we kind of downplayed it for whatever reason. What we've learned in probably the last... Mm, decade or so is that probably it's more critical role is in just our general longevity. Okay. Which uh -huh. goes, yeah, which is one of our topics for tonight, uh -huh. um, as well as our ability to it, our entire ability to kill cells that are no longer serving us 
is under the direct influence of the health, wealth, quality, quantity, and functionality of our mitochondria. So apoptosis, programmed cell death, is actually under the um, sort of direction of our mitochondria. That's pretty interesting, especially when you're thinking about cancer and sitting here with a pathologist, she can say more than anybody what the real danger of cancer is not the original tumor, right? It's what those cells can do over time. Boom. Uncontrollable, uncontrollable invasiveness, uncontrollable invasive growth. But Dr. Winters, let me ask you a question. Why? do we need apoptosis? What does it do? Why do we have to commit self-suicide? Because we have like, we've got this container, you know, that we're all walking around in and it only can hold so much mass. Now something very interesting, by the way, I can't help these little odd tidbits that stay in my head, you know, like weird, um, like travel songs or old like movie songs and weird quotes from movies and things about little tidbits about the mitochondria tend to be what stays in my brain. But what's important to know is about 10 to 20% of our body composition, depending on who you ask in the research realm is made up of our mitochondria. That's a, that's a pretty big chunk of who we are as a human being. The other cool thing about these little creatures, and I'll get to the direct answer to Dr. Silverman's question, is that these are ancient organisms that came from bacteria. And again, we're mostly bacteria, okay? So basically, when we poop, we're pretty much pooping bacteria. We, are, we have more bacterial um, little friends in our body than we do cells in our body. And weirdly, we have even more mitochondria in our body than we do the bacteria. Like we are taking up more real estate in our physical form with our mitochondria than pretty much anything else, which is very interesting to me, knowing that it comes from a very ancient evolutionary component of cell development is very interesting, especially as someone who's a pathologist who understands maybe what this might mean. But what this also means is that I did a presentation in... September back in London at a conference called the Health Optimization Summit. And my whole talk was on the mitochondrial Eve concept, which you can take it to sort of extreme uh, discussions around sort of biblical um, connotations of this, but really it talks about a very robust cell line that began 170,000 years ago that binds all of us together today. It's like a common denominator of all of who we are, which is alive in each and every one of us living and breathing on the planet today. That's fascinating to me, which also tells me that there's sort of a collective consciousness and awareness about what works and doesn't work in us as a whole. So when we look about the health and wealth of our mitochondria, we have survived 170,000 years of extreme climate changes where the seas, we started out in sort of East Africa and the seas dried up and created these sort of like stepping stones for us to morph our way over to the Middle East and hang out there for a couple, you know, 70,000 years. And then another big event happened that kind of moved us into southern europe which then we moved into like a period of time of the darkness which was just a giant explosion of of volcanic eruption that kept us in like this ash dark age that pretty much the only thing that survived were these stupid little mitochondria what is so fascinating to me is we've survived all of these lineages all these generations all of these traumatic events and yet what we've done to the health, the wealth, the efficiency, the effectiveness of the function of our mitochondria today in the last 150 years is far more damaging and scarring than what our little mitochondria endured the previous 170,000 years, which ties directly into the conversation we're having tonight of what gives, what's different. And what gives and what's different is that the types of things we're asking our bodies to adapt to it's asking us to adapt to it in such a short order that our, we can't keep up. And so we've always been a dual hybrid engine. We've always been able to burn sugar or fat, depending on what resources we had available to us since, frankly, the beginning of time. But after the Industrial Food Revolution in the 1850s, we have really gotten stuck in this sugar burning place. And our bodies have lost their ability to adapt and remember that we're all Priuses, okay? <laughs> and 
then when we get stuck in a particular sort of rogue, non-normal, you know, use of energy, there's a lot of destruction that happens around that. So that variability, that adaptability has been lost to most of us. In fact, there's a couple studies that came out. I presented, if you guys go to my website, I have a little free handout on metabolic flexibility on there. I have the exact link that was shared, I believe October, 2018, that Americans, and this might be true for all North Americans, Dr. Silverman, so not just US, but also our Canadian brothers and sisters, as well as our Mexico brothers and sisters, given the types of diseases we're all plagued with, is that less than 12% of the American population is considered metabolically flexible. And by that, I mean that 88% are better of people living in the United States today, their bodies have forgotten how to burn dual energy sources. And they're stuck in this browning, oxidative, high stress environment of just burning sugar. And it's like we have a brick on the, on the accelerator pedal of burning sugar only. And the damage of that is it makes for less efficient ATP production. So for every glucose molecule, we make 26 ATP. For every fat molecule, we make 36 ATP, right? Um, give or take, depending on the researcher you speak to, but give or take, it's a big difference. It's a statistically significant difference of how much energy you can make from a glucose molecule versus a fat molecule. But also, can I, can I just interrupt you for a second? Please. Yes. But the thing is, when we are so overburdened with sugar, the mitochondria can only produce that much of an ATP, and then it shuts down. Yeah. There is not enough capability yeah. of metabolizing it. And then that's when, you know, all this damage starts to happen. Right. And, you know, the way we talk about it from a biochemistry perspective, we talk about this respiratory uh, process. And so I tell people, basically, we're suffocating our mitochondria with sugar. It's like you just have poured, it's like filling the gas tank with sugar. Yes, you can sputter down the road for a little bit, but you will eventually break down. Okay. And so we need to start to clear that out and become that dual hybrid engine. That takes a lot of physical focus on our end because it's not natural for us anymore as it was up until the 1850s, right? And so we've moved into that. And so what that happens is we move into this place where we've got this sort of bastardized energy production and utilization and these more suffocated cells, we move into this sort of fermentation place and not the good ferments, right? This isn't like your good pickles. Okay? This is like the rotting, stinky ponds that are stagnant around your, you know, your neighborhood. That's what's fermenting. And that lack of respiration, that, that, that now changing energy sources, now those cells become even more rogue and more aggressive at usurping energy from other places where they shouldn't. So they start to steal your reservoirs from your muscle mass, from your heart, from your brain, from your kidneys. They start to take it and sequester it from other places. And so what happens in these moments is that also the cells stop listening to the signals that they're all invariably given, which is when to die. There's something called the Flickman equation, which means after a certain set number of recycled cells, the body says, thank you, we're done with you, carry on. We gobble them up, we spit them out, we digest them, we break them down and we move them out of circulation and out of our bowels and out of our urine and out of our breath. And we move them through all of our organs of elimination. That's what normal cell physiology is. That's healthy, non-rogue cell physiology. But when everything kind of gets backed up, confused, loses signaling, loses messages from you know, other cells around it, and it's fermenting and sort of becoming really crusty and stinky, it no longer dies at will. And so we end up with these clumps. We end up with lumps of cells in the wrong places, okay? Or it tissues in the body to become really, really toxic. Now, a lot of people will talk about acidity drives cancer, but actually cancer drives acidity. So when we look at which comes first, it's the rogue production of the energy that creates the stagnation, which leads to the acidity in the tissues, which draws more of that in, which is where we have a problem. Just like we keep trying to blame genes for the problem or acidity for the problem, these are responses to broken cellular communication, broken energy factory processing, broken cell death pathways, 
basically we can't create, bring in something fresh and new to clear out something old and broken. So it's like how we have spring cleaning in our lives, right? It's like we don't get spring cleaning in the body anymore after a period of time. It's so well spoken. So even before we touch the mitochondria, guys, we need to turn on our cellular vacuum cleaners. <laughs> Good. You, need to, you know, really to, to take out, to clean out that garbage. Yes. Yeah. Because there is no point of boosting mitochondria and talk about this if the cellular milieu is still dirty. That's when we, we need to rev up those cellular cleansing processes. Yeah. Yeah. And we all are built to take this on, you know, and so it's interesting where we've put our entire money, research dollars, resources into trying to fight cancer as a genetic disorder when it really affects what less than 5% doc, you know, Absolutely. That, you got that right. Yeah. And that's the place where, you know, we know if we took the hardware out of the cell, so the, the nuclea, the nucleus of the mitochondria, if we took it out and we placed it in a cell that is very, very sick into the nuclei of that cell, we will have a sick cell. We will continue to perpetuate that sick cell. But if you take a disease nucleus out of a disease cell and you put it into a healthy environment of a cell, we can actually turn that cell back on as a healthy cell again. This is the premise. They're called, you know, um, nuclear transfer studies. If you want to do a little Google search, this is how we started to recognize that maybe the DNA hypothesis for cancer and genetic hypothesis for cancer is not all it's cracked up to be. Not to say that we don't give it any credibility, but it certainly isn't the lion's share of what we're all contending with, right, in our lives. And so when we start to look at, wow, it's the terrain, it's the environment around those cells. It's like you guys, I know you've seen these analogies. I think even Dr. Spada and I talked about this at our last visit about the dirty fishbowl. You know, you can take the fish out, but you still have a dirty fishbowl. You put a fish in, the fish will succumb to that nastiness. But you take that fish out of the dirty fishbowl that's kind of sick and not doing well, and you put it into a fresh, clean, you know, new environment fishbowl, and the fish thrives. That's us. And this is what we have an opportunity to change at any given moment. And one of the conversations we wanted to talk about tonight is how do we activate that innate wisdom within each of us to sort of clean out our own fishbowl on a regular basis? This is awesome. But the thing, you remember you said that mitochondria is, again, we know about, oh, mitochondria is a powerhouse. But now you open another very important concept. Mitochondria controls our DNA. Yeah. It's and correct. that is why now we're going to be talking what, what you're supposed to talk about how, yeah. you know, that concept of, you know, fasting and autophagy and mitophagy and it's all yours. Oh, well, that's very kind. Well, first of all, there's, you know, it's interesting because I know just given the nature of uh, the research world right now and given the nature of the types of conversations I'm seeing on various Facebook pages, et cetera, there's a lot of concern and controversy around, oh my God, but autophagy causes cancer. Oh my God, but fats cause cancer. But oh my God, glu you know, uh, glucose causes cancer. Oh my God. So basically everyone has become like self-professed breatharians. And then we'll probably find a way that that causes cancer. You know, like those are, this is the nature of where we're going. But the way we look at it and the way we make those extrapolations, the way we say, yes, there's danger that this particular amino acid or this particular food, you know, fuel source or this particular lack of fuel source is the driver of cancer. These are done, all done in very myopic, very cell line, very medium controlled cell line or animal based studies. But none of us live in a Petri dish. None of us live in a cell line. None of us live within, you know, the, uh, a, 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 contr a controlled, contained laboratory environment where our, our mouse chow is measured out very specifically every day with a certain very specific macronutrient ratio that we don't alter. We just add extra things in or take certain things away. So my point is that I'm hoping that you start to recognize when you read the headlines of these things you have to remember that there are experts out there that have been in the trenches with themselves, with the patients, with the data that those patients offer that we're testing on. 
that shows us a very different picture than what perhaps some of these studies might suggest. So before everyone starts to throw out the what a, what a, coulda, shoulda, wouldas about, well, what about this, what about this? I want you to remember that context is everything, okay? So if you do go into deep, um, like fasting, and you have a very sick terrain that is not looking at other parameters that are feeding into that process, could you flip over and create problems in the future? Yeah, just like you could with anything else. You could do that with a carnivore diet. You could do that with a vegan diet. You could do that with a keto diet. You could do that with a Mediterranean diet. The point is, there is no single dietary intervention or nutraceutical intervention or pharmaceutical intervention that will ever take care of this. Our world, our culture has this very myopic belief that there's a single target and therefore a single treatment. Just looking right now, I don't even know how many people we have. I'm guessing, I think it says 26 participants and then however many will watch this later. Every single one of you have a very different reason as to what is happening in your chemistry right now that may or may not have implicated a cancering process within you. And each and every one of you have a different reason why you achieved that role and why you might be stable or not, or no evidence of disease or active, doesn't matter. The point is, is that there are no, we're like snowflakes, we're all completely individual. And we have to remember to take advantage of knowing our individuality, which in this day and age, with the work of the people that Spade and I study, and the people, the experts out there, we are in the most exciting time, I believe, ever in medicine that we no longer have to guess, that we are absolutely in the most pristine time of test, assess, address, and don't guess in our world. And we can know at any given moment when a certain dietary or lifestyle or supplement intervention is working or not working in a matter of weeks of initiating that therapy. So when we, I see people wasting so much valuable time and energy, frankly, fighting over whose diet is the best or whose supplement is the best or whose treatment is the best, Right there, you are keeping yourself out of the realm of healing. You're living and spinning your wheels in the exact cesspool that got you sick to begin with. So my recommendation is you stop that bullshit game right now and you start to look under the hood to know what makes you personally tick and you start to address that. So a really good example is no matter what diet you're on, take a look at your epigenetics, take a look at your labs, Take a look at your tissue type. Take a look at how you're feeling and lay all of those together and see where your common points or targets lie and then address those. And then know in a matter of anywhere from one to 12 months, you'll need to change it up again. I'm nearly 29 years out from a diagnosis that was really hell bent on making me not stand here in front of you tonight to communicate these types of concepts to tell you that the only way through this is to know yourself as an individual and to not get caught up on what your best friend's dog did or what somebody else on your forum did that you might not have thought about or what someone in your organization is doing or not doing in their clinical environment. So in that, one of the places we, can, we have been getting a lot of really cool research around is this concept known as sirtuins, S-I-R-T-U-I-N-S. Okay, and I've gotten really grooved out this past year on longevity and the concepts around this, which feeds right into our mitochondria, all right? And so sirtuins are these little family of proteins that act as metabolic sensors. Listen to what I just said there, metabolic sensors, which means they are paying very close attention to what fuel sources you're giving your body when, all right? So if you're constantly just feeding it one thing all the time, where in human history did we ever just stay with one particular food group or one particular dietary intervention for any period of time? We morphed with the seasons, the locale, right? We had this quality, this cleanliness within our diets around us. We ate in the rhythm of what was in, on, and around us. And we physically had to work very hard for a lot of those fuel sources. Today, we can literally have papaya in the dead of winter in Durango, Colorado, right? Never in human history have we been able to do things like that. Or that I can easily walk down the street here at any time 
24 seven and find food. We are constantly in a state of being overfed and undernourished, no matter what dietary choice or intervention we take. And that's something that a lot of us are taken for granted. And we've also been taught, as Dr. Shveta knows, when I was in medical school, you never wanted someone to go hungry. You had to feed them every two hours. Hunger was dangerous, right? And, and, and you had to keep their adrenals functioning and everything else flowing. They needed to make sure they're having something in their mouth, you know, three meals a day, plus snacks in between, and a snack at bedtime, and eat within the hour of getting up. That was the medical training I had with regards to nutrition. And what we've learned since then because this is what I think is so powerful. The power of medicine is that it's called the practice of medicine. Remember that, or the art of medicine is we learn new information and we move forward. But I'm here to tell you as someone who's walked through this journey with many of you, the thing that probably, when I look back now, because 2020 in, vision, in past vision, right? So I was so sick and the real estate in my body was taken up so much by the pressure of internal fluids building up in my abdomen and around my organs that I couldn't eat. And I spent those first few months literally not eating. And that's probably what saved my life. It stopped enough, it stabilized things enough with an end stage, stage four ovarian cancer diagnosis where my organs were in complete shutdown that if you believed everything you read about autophagy fueling a stage four cancer process, you would never be here today had you heeded that advice. I definitely wouldn't have been. Had I gone online and read that, I would have freaked out and not even attempted to try it. And yet I didn't have a choice. I couldn't eat. It was not happening for me. And after two and a half months, I was still here, expecting any day now to die. And the things I've learned, I have employed some form of fasting every year, if not every single season since 1991 with knowledge that I didn't have because it was accidental to things I started to learn over years. And the irony is choosing naturopathic medicine, our old school teachers and the lineage in which I come from was very, very hip to fasting. We jokingly say that naturopathic doctors were the original biohackers, right? So we, we talk about that in this place. So these are things that we learned along the way. And yet today, all these years later, where probably some of the biggest research that come out in the last few years around longevity is around fasting and autophagy. And yet in the realm of cancer, I'm seeing a lot of controversial information end up on websites and forums that are freaking people out of bringing this in to fruition. And what we see, as I said before, in cell lines and animal studies and Petri dishes is one thing, but I don't make those guesses or assertions. I'm checking in with my patients. I'm looking at their CBC with differential, their CMP, um, which is their metabolic panel. I'm looking at their trifecta, their sed rate, their LDH, and their CRP every single month while they're cancering. Do you realize the, lo the biggest longevity killer is an elevated C-reactive protein? Your prognosis as a cancer patient of overcoming that condition is pretty much stuck if your C-reactive protein is elevated. You cannot apoptose cancer cells if CRP is high. You have a poor response to conventional medical therapies if your CRP is high you absolutely um, have worse side effects and multiple drug resistance if your CRP is high. And one of the most profound ways to lower your inflammatory protein marker is with fasting, right? And so it's the folks like the Blue Zone experts and the Walter Longo researchers and longevity institutes around the world that started to learn about the CERT1 and CERT3 proteins that are these sensors that basically tell us they respond to the availability of the currency in our bodies, okay? The currency of fuel sources that are available. And so one of those fuel sources is, in a, is NAD. NAD is, is a component, it's a, a coenzyme of, ener of energy production, all right? Now, a lot of you might know this particular energy production protein as, our, as niacin or niacinamide. Okay. And it's an interesting thing that it's one of the B vitamins. So guess what? If you've been on a long diet of malnourishment or taking birth control pills or a lot of pharmaceuticals, those wipe out your niacin levels faster than you can shake a stick. If you've been living a long-term vegan or vegetarian diet without supplementing those things in some form or fashion, you're missing some of the critical building blocks for your energy production. 
And so where we talk about in the blue zones and the Mediterranean diet, and we think that it's about what the people are eating, I'm here to burst your bubble and explain to you that the reason why these folks are thriving is because they spend an average of 200 days a year fasting. The main cultures of the Mediterranean cultures and the blue zones are they live in environments that have a lot of spiritual drivers of, their, of the way they eat. And so the Orthodox Christian environments of these blue zones have a ton of fasting in the midst. And so I'm always trying to explain to people, maybe it's not so much about what we're eating, it's about when or how much we're eating. And when we really look at longevity today, we're finding that those who actually um, caloric restrict a little bit more often will have a longer longevity than those that sort of overfeed. And of course, any of you in the realm of cancer and cancer care, you're been, it's just been beaten into you to not lose pound, to not lose weight, to just keep eating. As long as you don't lose weight, you'll be good. Guess what? <laughs> you know, that is about the worst advice you could have ever given to a cancer patient. And so these are the things, you know, again, you don't have to guess, you don't have to take my word for it. You can look under the hood and test you. We can even test your sirtuin levels. We can check in your molecular markers of your cancer type, what types of sirt sirtuin activity you have. We can see if you have the ones that keep your cancer cells alive or the ones that turn your cancer cells off. We can tell which ones are gonna be responsive to dietary changes and which ones won't be. This is where we've gotten in the medical field today. And when we look at sirtuins themselves, their job is a cellular regulatory process. And they do things like help with DNA transcription, aging, apoptosis, inflammation, support, immune um, uh, regulation, reaction, like it responds and reacts to that currency we talked about of caloric restriction. Also, sirtuins are very involved in our circadian rhythm pathways. It's very interesting. So as I'm sitting here in front of all of you in a dark room tonight, luckily I've got my crazy blue blockers plus blue screens on my light plus a weird full spectrum light overhead. You know, it's like I have to take whatever things I can do to mitigate my blue light exposure after sunlight. I'd love to see the rest of you sitting there in your bright red sunglasses, you know, like glasses right now, blocking me coming through to you in this way. But your sirtuins are responding to that blue light and that circadian rhythm. And then also the sirtuin proteins respond to cells stress response and specifically oxidative stress. So when you're eating too much sugar, when you're overfeeding, when you're not giving your body breaks between meals, we need at least four hours between meals, preferably longer, to allow autophagy and sirtuins to be activated. We start to overfeed and, over and undernourish our bodies. When we exercise too much or too little, we impact these. When we're constantly flooded with blue light from our screen time, when we don't go outside and enjoy first sunrise and sunset, that's why tonight I was a little bit late watching the sunset so I could get that beautiful, powerful red frequency that is telling my pineal gland, it's time for bed soon. Start to deactivate things. These are all what these little proteins are telling our body. And when you look at the longevity environments that are out there in the world today, everyone is arm wrestling over their diet and yet the diet is one tiny piece of the puzzle. It's so much about their community and their time in nature and the rhythm and the timing of which they eat or don't eat and the, the oxytocin they share in their sisterhood or whatever it is that is really powerful to change the regulations. And it's also things like polyphenol rich foods. If you've got SNPs that can deal with coffee beautifully, make sure it's organic. It's one of the only sources of polyphenols in the Western culture today is our coffee. Then if you have a good CYP1A2 SNP that's a fast metabolizer, go for it. It'll act like medicine in your body. If you're over-exercising, you're oxidizing those sirtuin proteins and causing problems. So all of my endurance athletes, I worry about you guys that are out there running their 100-mile marathons. You know, it's like those, are, those patients die young, okay? They, they, don't, they don't have longevity. So it's, it's impressive what they can do, but do we need to do that? You know, I'd rather be 100 walking a few miles a day versus 30 running 100 miles a day, you know? Big difference in the way we think about our world. And then things like saunas, 
or even cryotherapy, the other end of the spectrum are things that will upregulate the sirtuin activity. And my point is what I'm hoping you guys are hearing about these particular proteins is that their job description sounds very much like where we started our conversation tonight with regards to mitochondrial function. And if you start to look at the overlap of our mitochondrial function in these particular proteins, the sirtuins that are coming you know, through us by our diet and lifestyle choices day by day, you realize they're very much in bed together. And we have so much more power to change their expression by conversations like this and helping us get back into rhythm. And so it seems like we are all out there kind of fighting the good fight, but we've gotten so out of rhythm. I mean, my question to your team here, and I'd love if anybody wants to open up the screen and wave at me, but how many of you spend more than 15 minutes outside every single day? Every single day, watch the sunrise or sunset. Know where we are in the moon, moon phase right now, right? That makes me happy. I love seeing those when I see folks do that, but guess what? The majority of folks don't. We're the, we're, we're the weird ones. You know, my friends have jokingly for 30 years called me the hippie dippy granola girl. But I'm like, but this hippie dippy granola girl knows where my food comes from, knows my, where my water comes from, knows what phase of the moon I'm in, knows what season I'm in, knows what foods are local and organic and available to me, knows who my friends are out there, and knows who my enemies are and how to get away from them. I don't have to choose to convene with toxic, sick people. My point is that we all get to make choices in making better connections for ourselves to make those lumps of cells sing or get stagnant. And it's so brilliant that we have a pathologist who's allowing this forum for us to ha even have this conversation because when I talk, I hear myself and I sound like the full on hippy dippy kid right here. And yet when you talk to a pathologist, this is the woman who looks in the microscope at your cells and sees it in real time, the impact of the terrain around those cells causing derangement or health of how those cells respond. When it's too late. Yeah. And the cool thing is hopefully, everyone sitting here listening knows that I personally don't think it's ever too late. Right? That's as much as it might feel like you're in a free fall, I'm here to tell you guys, I know what free fall looks like. It still freaks me out to this day to even remember where I was. It still brings so much emotion. Because if I had believed everything they told me, and I want to be very clear, I had no expectation of surviving this. I had no expectation. I was just like, if I'm going down, I'm going down understanding why I'm dying of this. That's what I hope to leave with. I hope to leave with an awareness of the why Again, a conversation where we started tonight, and I'm still learning that why almost 29 years later. My hope and goal is that we're all learning the why of our own individual path, maybe together, and learning how to inspire that and have these conversations. And every time I see a cool study about longevity or sirtuins or mitochondrial health or the very fact that everyone's starting to scratch their heads and say, you know, maybe it isn't about the DNA. Maybe it is about the mitochondria. I'm like, don't you guys remember Dr. Bissell, Mina Bissell back in the late 80s telling us, I mean, talk about a pathologist, oncology researcher, goddess, who was telling us way back then, kids, it's all about the train. It's whatever you feed into that medium that turns those cells on and off. It's not about what's happening at those cells. This is where I get fired up and inspired. And I know there are many tools. Like I know that Dr. Silverman has access to some good nutraceuticals that can impact the sirtuin expression and mitochondrial or you know, Krebs cycle pathways. But there's also, hopefully from what you've heard from me tonight, there's so many dietary lifestyle means of addressing that as well. And sometimes we need a little bit more um, to support us. And there's even pharmaceutical ways to go after some of these things. But, you know, I, I like to try lifestyle and diet and changes in lifestyle and diet and ways to check yourself to know if what you're doing is working or not. Because we, we hope that what we're doing is working, but we can't know unless we test. All right, and that's where a lot of people talk about, well, it's really expensive to test and do these things, but it's also really expensive to be guessing and to end up being a patient who sees me who spent $70,000 on a therapy that fell apart that never worked, right? It's like, wow, was that even the appropriate treatment for you? And 
from what I can tell by looking at someone's train at that point, it's not. And so that's where we're having these kind of conversations of helping inspire you to dig a little bit deeper and look at things you can do for free at home, start to look at your own cycles, your own relationships, your own relationships with food, the timing of your eating. So simply put, we kind of talk about well, what can I do right now today, right in this moment? Simplest thing, especially if you're breast cancer thrivers on this site, which I know there's a bunch because I see a few of few of my famous names on here. Hi, everybody. It's so good. To, it's fun to see um, so many folks I recognize from the Facebook forum world. But the simplest place to start for all of you is 13 hours of fasting every single day. Okay, good, good. And that's a good, like, this is where I love it. Like, and, and Dr. State is doing the thumbs up because the study through MD Anderson a couple years ago, it didn't even ask these women what they ate. It was just when they ate or didn't eat. And they took 44,000 women and they fat, you know, they basically like, tell us your eating schedule. And those that fasted for 13 hours or longer every day had a 70, 70% less recurrence rate than those that just ate forever and ever, like on and on. Simple. It's not even asking you to change anything. But here's what I think is so interesting. As I told you in that study about metabolic flexibility, if you're someone like the 88% of us in the United States, it's metabolically inflexible. Even asking you to do 13 hours is going to be very challenging. And I want to really honor that. Okay, you got to start somewhere. So maybe you can only go eight hours in the first few weeks. But you're going to work towards it. And so by that, I mean, if you're the, someone who you get really wobbly by the time it's bedtime and you're like fantasizing about when you can jerk, burst out of bed and start eating again, <laughs> you're likely metabolically inflexible. If you get hangry after skipping a meal for four hours, you're metabolically inflexible. If you get nauseous or feel wonky after skipping a meal, you're metabolically inflexible. If you're able to finish dinner, say at 6 p.m. and not have anything by mouth but water until 7 a.m. the next morning, you've got some flexibility. You've got some things to work with. And so that's really, really powerful here that you can start to build on that. So I tell folks every day, shoot for 13 hours. And then twice a week, kick it up a notch. Maybe shoot for 16 hours twice a week. Again, you notice I'm not even asking you to change things in your diet. Okay. The next step would be Start to do something like a chronometer or a MyFitnessPal and just get a good sense without censoring yourself. Just find out what type of carbohydrate load you're taking in. So for instance, even a registered dietitian will tell folks that in a healthy adult, this is not even a cancering adult. So remember, our metabolic pathways in cancer are very different than our metabolic health pathways and healthy cells, right? So these are apples and oranges. For those of you with cancer or a history of cancer, this is one conversation. For those of you trying to prevent cancer and don't have cancer, another conversation, right? So just kind of keep that mentally separated out here. Basically, if you are someone who's trying to kind of prevent cancer, take a look at your carbohydrate intake and know that the registered dietitians say you should be eating less than 100 grams of sugar a day, okay? Now, it, that seems like, that's ah, a lot of sugar a day. But when you start to do your own MyFitnessPal or your, any of the chronometers and you start to add it up, you will realize that most Americans have eaten three days worth of sugar by the end of breakfast. It's pretty impressive, especially if you're following the ADA recommendation. So there's your Cheerios with your low fat milk and your glass of orange juice and your piece of, you know, a little bit of banana or dried fruit on your cereal. That is three days worth of sugar at breakfast right? That's a shock to people when they start to realize that. Now, in the cancering patient, we want to shoot for less than 50 grams of sugar per day. Now, notice here, you'll see different sites that talk about net carbs, total carbs, sugar, etc. I'm starting simply for this group of a starting point to shoot for less than 50 grams of sugar. That's not even carbohydrate a day. Now, if you're dealing with some extra cancering processes that are very driven by sugar, such as breast, endometrial, uterine, brain, lung, colorectal, and prostate cancer, then you need to be shooting for less than 20 grams of sugar per day. That's your goal, to start to starve off and change all these other metabolic pathways and address all of the hallmarks of cancer simultaneously and enhance the treatments that you're doing, whether they're um, standard of care only or an integrative combination of things to make for better outcomes and increase your response to those therapies in a pretty profound way. You basically stress the system by lowering your sugar intake. 
So for instance, radiation doesn't work well in bodies with high sugar content because the cancer cells become non-responsive to radiation when insulin is high. And if you take in the radiation while your insulin is high, you also have a much higher incidence of you know, extreme derangement of those cells even further and recurrence or progression. And so these are the things that I want patients to understand. Like you can even make your standard of care therapies work much more profoundly in these ways. And so those are some places to start. And then if you really want to get groovy, you could start to actually check your morning sugars, your fasting sugars in the morning. And then mm, three to four hours after waking or a late afternoon blood ketone level, just to see if your narrow window eating and daily small amounts of intermittent fasting and 16 hours twice a week fasting are enough to put you into a little nutritional ketosis. Guess what? If you are metabolically flexible, you will see trace ketones. Pretty interesting. And that's not even you eating a 70 to 90% of your diet is fat. <laughs> okay. And that's what's so cool to me is that that puts us back into our natural dual hybrid engine burn that we were accustomed to doing since the beginning of humanity. And it's pretty exciting to me because that alone helps take out all the garbage that Spade and I have been talking about while increasing mitogenesis, so new healthy turnover into new mitochondria, while helping take out and apoptose broken cells that are damaged and deranged and a little mucky from whatever, for whatever reasons, and that we're basically recycling and regenerating on a regular basis. Those are the types of things we want to focus with. So that's a lot. I think that's my soapbox for now. And I would love whatever you want to add, ask, dump, you know, comment on. I just want you to get that sort of broad stroke vision of the landscape that we're looking at today to help the majority of us have a good response. And then if you need to get more nuanced, you can based on your own individual findings. Oh my God. This is, <laughs> you this so is the best lecture. This is the best lecture I've ever attended. You're so, it's so basic. So I always feel like it's so but This bad. is incredible. I don't know how basic it is. It is that package of health. This is a package of healthy lifestyle. That's what it is with, with an explanation. It's incredible. Just, you know, I've got like, you know, tons of notes and stuff. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. Guys, questions? Yeah. Uh, can you see? I just saw that there's a couple that popped out in your chart, in your chat room. And I saw that Jamie was asking about if you can fast for longer than 13 hours. First of all, I would like to do a little tennis clap for that because that's an awesome starting point, right? So when people say, what's the max you should go? Now, this is where the nuances might adjust. So I would say, you know, 13 hours every day, 16 hours twice a week. If you're actively cancering, then you might even look at three days a month on top of that. And people like Dr. Walter Longo and Dr. Thomas Seafried and a whole group of people I just heard speak at the Metabolic Health Summit that spoke on so many of these topics around the confusion of where autophagy could get you in trouble in the cancer world. Thank God I'm hearing from the experts out there. But basically these docs say, if we could all fast five to 10 days once or twice a year, we would be increasing our longevity exponentially and lowering our risk for all mortality. I thought that was pretty bold for a group of scientific researchers that are looking through this, they're looking through the lens of like Dr. Silverman that are looking through at the cell line level, but these are doctors that are employing this in their own lives because the data is so compelling to them that even as researchers, they're practicing these habits. Oh, absolutely. This is a must. Yeah. You can, I cannot teach you anything if I do it. If I don't do it, then I'm a hypocrite and flow. So when you said that you read the list of ingredients, well, I will scrutinize the list of ingredients, A, eh? and then, you know, so I know exactly where, what I eat. I know where it's coming from. I know where my eggs, I know my chicken chickens i know absolutely and if i teach you fasting i will do fasting yeah. you know absolutely you've got to lead by example and i'm you know that's that's who you are yeah. you teach what you, you preach what you live right 
Right. And, and that's how I think, you know, that's why I am so intrigued. But when I see people's stories, I'm very much a follower of other people's in equals one experiences because it's an, an equals one experience. It's really powerful. But when that in equals one experience starts to become the dogma of how people should live their lives, that's where it gets a little tricky because we have very different constitutions. Like for me, I can eat a pint of raspberries and nothing happens to my glucose, to my glucose and ketones. My husband eats two and it spikes his blood sugar. That's our variability, right? That's just a very different thing between us. And, and whereas other things like a bean or a bad night of sleep or a little stress response for me, my insulin shoots off the charts. Where my husband's like the Zen master, like the dude could, it's just, it's cr incredible. Like someone could almost like run over his legs with a car and he'd be like, no problem here. Like super, thank God we found each other to balance this out. But like we all have different things that spike our imbalances, our strengths and our weaknesses. And so I think that's really powerful. And then, I so love that you yeah, that. It's, it's, it's finally that individual medicine, personalized medicine. It's so much fun to me because I know we've been giving lip service to it for a while, but the reality is it's on paper. It's not what's happening at the lab, right? It's not, I mean, it's not happening at the bedside. It's been happening in a lab or at the bench, but what's happening in my arena for some years and my colleagues arena for some years is we're seeing the translation at the bedside. So the cool thing is we're having the bench to come to the bedside, but also the bedside go to the bench. And that's where you, all the listeners right now, are changing medicine faster than even Dr. Silverman's of the world or Nisha Winters of the world can change medicine because we are, we're simply the messengers, but you guys are in the trenches living it and doing it. And that's huge. And so I'm incredibly grateful for that. And then when I see something, you know, one of the other questions that came up is there a certain ketone level to look out for on a daily basis? and also during radiation treatment and blood sugar levels. So that's a really good question. That's gonna vary a little bit from person to person and cancer type and history. Um, ultimately, if you're going through radiation treatment, I'm wanting to push people up to be in nutritional ketosis all the time, which is a blood ketone level of 0.8 to two. And 20 to 30 minutes prior to their radiation treatment, I have them take exogenous ketones to bump it a little bit further. That will enhance the cell kill even more that will drive, it was like the Trojan horse of driving the radiation into the cancer cell while protecting the sort of uh, terrain around those cells even further. So that's a really powerful way to do this. So a lot of my colleagues, um, especially in the brain cancer world, if they're doing uh, brain radiation, use this therapy. Um, and then as far as blood sugar levels, this is what's tricky. Blood sugars are hard. Glucose are the worst to test because they're so transient. And people have what's known as the dawn effect. So their cortisol levels start to rise in the early morning hours, which will give rise to a higher glucose in the morning. Ideally, I'd like your glucose to be below 80, 85 in the morning, but some people just never will get it there. So I don't want that to create more stress, which will of course keep your glucose high. But ultimately our goal is to kind of keep what's called this GKI level of less than one. And it's a, a formula that Dr. Seafried and others have put together. You can look up the GKI um, glucose ketone index and get the little you know, algorithm, uh, you know, to, to check yourself, but basically you want higher ketones, lower, um, glucose in the midst of cytotoxic therapies, be it radiation, be it hyperbaric oxygen, be it, um, hyperthermia, be it IV vitamin C or certain, you know, like cytoxin or some of the other chemotherapies. That's where we can use that not as a means to starve the cancer of sugar, but to weaken the cancer to, the standard of care therapy. That's what a lot of people forget is when we're using a ketogenic diet or ketones, we're not using them as a diet. We're using them like a chemotherapy sword. Okay, we're using it as a therapy. That's a big difference here. But when you start to become metabolically flexible and you're eating in a more and more narrow window, you will start to show trace ketones on your blood levels without even trying because that's how you're made to be. So I think that's pretty powerful. And then this is a great question about, so some would recommend not taking chloroquinone to stop autophagy of cancer as suggested elsewhere. So there's so many cool uh, implications in the realm of off-label drug use. And I've been using off-label drugs in cancer patients for over 20 years, well before it was ever hit, okay? <laughs> so a lot of my colleagues, I was able to just fly to Europe and see where they've been using this for 30, 35 years in there. And as a naturopathic doctor, I know the mechanism of action of these pharmaceuticals on these metabolic pathways, and I have a lot of safer options in the natural you know, realm from herbs to supplements to 
um, you know, other therapies to hit those same pathways without a pharmaceutical intervention. So I'm also the person who's looking at people's SNPs. Like for instance, if you have a CYP2C9, STAR3, you don't really do well with metformin or a CoQ2, you don't do well with statins. So the examples start to show that even some of those off-label drugs, those drugs won't work in those patients. So, you know, we might want to shut down those pathways, but if you don't have the metabolic means of using those drugs, that drug is never going to work for you, all right? It's like CYP2D6 with tamoxifen. I mean, these are the ridiculous things that our bodies will find ways around. So the real key is about hitting all the terrain conditions with your diet, your lifestyle, your thoughts, your relationships, your supplements, changing things up, testing, regularly, and altering. That's how I hit these pathways. And because I'm running tests so much, so frequently, this little creature wants to be part of our story here. Um, I know if autophagy would be causing my problems. If I start to see people's labs get worse in the direction of cancering, then I know maybe that strategy of dietary intervention isn't working. But I've been at this for a very long time and I've never seen fasting cause a continuation or a progression of cancer, right? Like just haven't seen it, nor have my colleagues in this arena. So, you know, I think these are just some things that I would ask what metrics folks are using to determine if those drugs are, first of all, tolerated, if they meet them metabolically and epigenetically on the right levels, and what metrics they're using to see if those drugs are doing what they're claiming they are doing. That would be true for any therapy you choose. Standard of care, off-label drug, naturopathic interventions. My biggest pet peeve is when someone comes and says, well, I did... IV vitamin C and art, artemisinin, and I did, you know, this and this and this therapy, this other clinic, and I spent all this money. I'm like, well, why did they choose those therapies for you? And the patient has no idea how to answer it. I'm like, well, go back and ask him. And the doctors have no idea how to answer that. They're like, because that's the protocol I do. I'm like, that isn't good enough anymore. We don't live in that time anymore. We get to get so, so specific today. This is what's so exciting about the work that um, Dr. Spade and I get to do is we get to see it in real time with people. And then finally, the kind of question here is like around um, Lyme disease. Now, Lyme, I tell you, I like my heart goes out to anybody with Lyme disease. I know that cancer probably all has some element of co-infections. Lyme disease, probably part of it. But Lyme can be such a wild card in people's bodies. And it's so based on our microbiome and our personal experiences and our epigenetics and so many, just like cancer. So to me, my colleagues who are experts in Lyme tell me they'd rather treat Lyme over cancer. And I tell them I'd rather treat cancer over Lyme any day. And the irony is we're all doing the same thing. We're trying to find the individual and address them. And so my colleagues have told me that fasting with Lyme's disease is actually very effective because you get such die off from some of the therapies that treat Lyme that the sickness can overwhelm you know, from the die off experience. And that Fasting can help people tolerate the die-off in a pretty profound way. I would really encourage you to work with a Lyme expert like Darren Ingalls or others in this arena, um, but that's what uh, the feedback they've given me. So I'm sorry I can't answer it specifically, but I've definitely seen some interesting you know, discussions around it. And then I appreciate someone saying thanks for this, that it feels basic, but it's good to hear. And I'm the same way. My brain is so, um, I'm very visual. I'm very story centric. I don't see, I see things in patterns and systems. So I'm not really good at black and white as some of you know. So when someone asks me a question, I can't just go yes or no. And it drives you all crazy. And I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> but it's, it's just, it's because we aren't that way. So I think that's pretty cool. And then someone asked the question around um, the gene that shows radiation is harder for you. Really there's not a gene. It's about, um, well, I take that back, P53, suppressor gene, um, MDMR genes, some of the genes around COL1A1 or CAT, CAT SNPs, these are genes that are highly susceptible to oxidative stress of any kind, radiation in particular. We can also look at a blood test called an 8OHDG, which is a marker of DNA damage. And so I like to get a baseline of that through Great Plains Laboratories before somebody initiates a therapy such as radiation, and then check it at the end. Because guess what? If radiation was a problem, that number is going to go up. And if you see that number go up at the end of radiation, you're going to be doing all you can to quiet that oxidative stress fire as quickly as possible. And I will tell you from personal experience, an 8-OHDG with radiation usually always means that patient was, had blood sugar metabolism issues. 
Okay. And so we can turn that around really fast by getting the patient on a low carbohydrate diet. So that's pretty cool that we can take that information and use it. And then of course, inflammation in general, radiation will be made worse if your C-reactive protein is high. Um, just like chemotherapy side effects will be worse if CRP is high. Recurrence will be worse if CRP is high. So you want to force your doctors to be running this standard test on every single one of you if you're dealing with prevention of disease or prevention of recurrence or even seeing how you're responding to any of your therapies along the way. And they're also showing you just your general ability to have a healthy, happy, hearty mitochondria or a healthy, happy, you know, uh, you know, smart sirtuin protein uh, response. So these are pretty huge here. And then, aw, thank you for the kind words about loving my book. I really appreciate that. And so much, there's just such beautiful gratitude flowing through in this chat group. So I'm really, uh, I'm really grateful for that. I'm grateful to see a small herd of people up late tonight hanging out with me in Central Standard Time and beyond. So thank you for that. Any other burning thoughts or questions you felt like, Dr. Silverman, your, your tribe would like to I'm, hear? I am so grateful. I am so overwhelmed. You know, I'm like a zebrafish. My attention <laughs> is 45 seconds. So uh, this is so incredible. Such a great volume of information. Such an enforcement of belief that we just need to be healthy. And this is a complex. This is no diet. This is not supplements. This is that lifestyle, individual but healthy lifestyle, whether you're vegan, whether you're carnivore, but you got to live happy and healthy. And then we're going to, uh, uh, and we need to do that fasting, that intermittent fasting. To me, it's like a must deal. It is. And then it the- our playing field more even when we can intervene with that. Oh, really and then the mites and the NAD and the sirtuins. I am so grateful, Dr. Winters. Nasha, I love you with <laughs> all my heart. Thank you so, so much. And I envy that you can go outside to look at the sun <laughs> in your beautiful Mexico with your, with your dogs. And sometimes even with your cats, I see. And I I well, it's so happy yeah, well, thank you. And thank you. You always are such a positive force. I mean, you guys feel this, I'm sure, of, of being with this woman and seeing her out there. It's just so much fun, right? I love the little yes, you know, everywhere here. And um, I don't know, it just, it's, it, it means a lot when I keep finding other like-minded people. And even this, this comment from Sarah here at the bottom, you know, when people say I'm not crazy to pursue this lifestyle, none of us are like, no one's like, well, likes the idea of going hungry, right? Or pushing ourselves and, and making ourselves uncomfortable, but know that you are not alone. Know that you have people like Dr. Spada and myself. I've got a really amazing colleague, Dr. Mindy Peltz, P-E-L-Z. If you don't know this woman, she has an online Facebook forum that takes people monthly through intermittent fasting processes with like thousands of people from all over the world for free just to be on her forum. So if you wanna have someone where you can ask a lot of questions and really have someone holding your hand on how to initiate even the basics of intermittent fasting, follow Mindy's work. She does some pretty cool stuff out there if you're just looking for your tribe to help you get through this. But I'm really grateful for all of your time and energy tonight, everybody. And if there are any follow-up questions that are burning that you didn't feel like you wanna share with the group, you pass them on to Dr. Silverman and she will pass them to me. And I'm gonna give you back a little heart too, my friend. Thank you for that. Well, Much love, everybody. Being on the Zoom, thank you for everyone. Gratitude. Thank you for Nasha's. Uh, thank you for mine. Guys, you know how to reach out to Nasha. If you, I mean, uh, Nasha's followers, if you want to reach out to me again, this is this was posted on Facebook. We both have websites. Uh, mine is on um, www.askdrsilverman.com. So guys, this is all to health and I'm so grateful. And I hope this is not the last one, Dr. Winters. You know it, you, you can always get me flapping my jaws. So thank you. <laughs> every, every day in that six month period. Love you all guys. Blessings, Good night. Good night.